This report is really a synthesis of a lot of other work. So um, it's a th synthesis of the work of a lot of other scholars, a lot of other activists, civil society organizations. Um, so there's a lot that I can't take credit for. It really was drawing upon the work of many other people. Um, but it's one that tries to give a kind of overview of militarized policing in the UK and defines policing very broadly. So I'm not in this report, it, it doesn't just look at territorial police forces. For example, there's quite a bit about the home office and the border force and, and really looks at, at policing broadly construed. Um, it also very much takes a global view, so tries to situate Britain within a broader global story, looking, for example, at the ways in which Britain has trained foreign police and security services abroad, and also the, the role of British firms in the export of anti-protest and surveillance technologies, because this is very much part of a global story. And one of the, the underlying premises, uh, arguments of the piece, which is not my argument, is an argument that other scholars, other activists have made, is that in many respects, militarized policing is not new. And I think that's actually what Annie was touching on and, and what she'll speak about a bit later. If we look at the broader history of policing, not only in the UK, but across the, the former British Empire, we see that the line between the military and the police has always been very blurry. Um, and so it's very easy to take a very present, presentist view on this issue. Um, there is a newly published book out that I actually think one of the authors might be on this call called Charged. And one of the things the book argues is that much of the, the violent crackdown that we've seen of late against protesters here in the UK is hardly new, that we can trace a lot of the tactic, tactics used, such as the use of batons, horse charges, kettling, back to the 1980s when we saw very similar uh, tactics being deployed, for example, against the Brixton up uprising. So there's, I think it's really important to take this broader historical perspective and even though the report is ultimately much more focused on the contemporary era, I, I think that's an important point to keep in mind so that we recognize what is new and what's not new about the present moment. Um, I really am not going to attempt to summarize the report as a whole. Um, it touches on a, a range of issues from racialized, the racialized policing of gangs to again, the UK training of foreign services uh, and, and foreign security and policing agencies and to militarize border control. I'm gonna instead touch on one aspect of the report that, that links the most to my own area of, of expertise, which is around tech and surveillance. Um, and I, one of the things the, the report really touches on is the growing role of high tech uh, surveillance systems within policing in, in the UK, as well as the role of the private tech sector and the close relationships that they've developed um, in providing certain kinds of equipment and technology to policing bodies in this country. Um, now, in saying that, I want to be very clear that tried and tested much older forms of surveillance, um, such as embedding undercover cops or making use of informants, those are still very much in use. And I do think there's often a tendency to perhaps even focus too much on cutting edge technologies and overlook the role of these much older techniques. But we're also seeing the role of, um, again, new high-tech tools. So things ranging from biometric databases to fingerprint scanners, to phone and, and data extraction tools, to telecommunication surveillance tech, to facial recognition technology, both live and retrospective. And many of these technologies are discussed in the report. Now, another thing that I think is really important that I want to note is that it's really important that we not feed into kind of self-serving narratives of tech companies and uh, the police themselves. And it's important to note that these technologies have not necessarily made police forces all seeing or panoptic. Many times these technologies don't work, although even when they don't work, it doesn't mean they don't cause harm. So to give one example, we know that some of the most 
widely used facial recognition uh, algorithms often systematically misidentify women and non-white people. Um, many, in many cases, even when the technology, the facial recognition technology itself works very well, there are flaws with the data, uh, the backend database. So we shouldn't assume that these technologies are somehow flawless. But what we do know is that they are in various ways expanding the power of the police. We know that um, they often enable policing agencies to, to synthesize and use vast amounts of data in ways that, that they couldn't necessarily uh, do before. We know that they often have chilling effects on protesters, which is a topic that I think Adam is going to discuss shortly. Um, we know that they're often, they often amplify existing racist and classist practices. Um, and they, we know they often shape the way that people engage with public space. I want to give one case study that's touched on in more depth in the report, and that is the case case of, of mobile fingerprint scanners. So over the last few years, more and more police forces have been equipped with mobile uh, fingerprint scanners, um, which, in, which they're increasingly using during routine stop and searches. And what uh, these scanners enable police to do is to cross-check um, people against existing home office databases. Uh, at the moment, that's the immigration and asylum biometric system, which holds the biometrics of non-citizens who enter the country, and another database called Indent One, which is the law enforcement and security biometric system, which holds the biometrics of people taken into custody by the police. Um, and there's growing efforts on the part of the Home Office to further merge these database backends. And this, again, gives the police much more unprecedented power. Um, it, it, among other things, enables them to do, um, to effectively act, you know, as border guards, so to speak, in, insofar as they can check on people's immigration status. Um, and we know from the work of organizations like um, the Racial Justice Network and Yorkshire Resist that these fingerprint scanners have been disproportionately used um, against people, non-white populations um, and non-white individuals who are stopped. So there's a huge discrepancy and, and disproportionality in the way that they're deployed. Um, there was also an increase in their use during lockdown. And this is just one example of, I think, a very troubling use of biometric technologies in the course of everyday policing. Um, it's also important to know the links with, um, between biometrics and combat more broadly, we know that to a large extent, many of these large mega biometric databases uh, come out, they're kind of increasing normalization and use come out of combat settings like in Iraq and Afghanistan. We know that the post 9-11 climate really helped to um, promote and facilitate um, their, their use uh, and their normalization. Um, and I also think what these kinds of technologies show us is also the growing role of the private tech sector in policing. We know that a lot of tech companies are seeing police and security agencies as a new kind of market for their goods and equipment. We know um, also that this often feeds into the logic of austerity and privatization. So, Police forces facing funding cuts are often being encouraged to turn to automated systems that ostensibly are meant to cut costs, ostensibly are meant to um, um, do more of the work uh, and do work more efficiently, um, which I think is, is a somewhat uh, dubious proposition. Um, and we can see mobile fingerprintings as part of a range of techniques that are being used. Um, uh, digi digitized techniques that are being used to increasingly survey um, the British population. And these often range, I would say, from very crude techniques like the use of social media surveillance, for example, um, looking at people's posts, often in an effort to make 
uh, very dubious conclusions about their so-called gang affiliations, all the way to more sophisticated uh, tools such as live facial recognition, which has been deployed, for example, in the streets of London, has also, Wales has also been at the forefront uh, of using this technology um, for purposes of ambient surveillance. Um, and I think this is one very troubling aspect that has huge implications for civil liberties, as I said, for the, the right of people to move freely in public space, and also in terms of the, the risks of just having profound chilling effects on protesters and activists. Um, I'm going to end there and really happy to discuss this report in more depth with fellow panelists.